What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. As always, BDGE. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. If you're joining us on YouTube, if you're joining us via the podcast, welcome back. It is Thursday and every other week, starting two weeks ago and going forward, we are going to be looking at trade targets. Some buy low, some sell high. We're talking about guys whose values may have plummeted or risen greatly over the last week or two. You can get them at a kind of an off value where where their sh where their value should not be compared to the rest of season value. Very much like the stock market, especially when it comes to dynasty. That's why dynasty is fun because trades matter just as much as the draft throughout the year. So you have to be able to decipher players' values rest of season, not just what they've done in the last couple games. That's what I'm here to do for y'all. So we're going to take a look at, I think, three guys on my buy low list, three guys on my sell high list. I hope y'all enjoy. So if you've enjoyed my videos up to this point in the season, a thumbs up would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you are new to the channel, subscribe. We are coming at you with fantasy football goodness all season long up until your chip. And that's really it. So we will start this video off now. And before we hop into the video, uh, I want you to drop a comment down below who are you know, one or two of your buy low or sell high guys right now, because I like to hear y'all feedback and sometimes it factors into the things I do in my league. So drop a comment down below, letting me know guys you're targeting in trades right now or selling at this moment. So we're going to jump into my buy low candidates, first of which is the running back of the Carolina Panthers, C-Mac, Christian McCaffrey. Now he's not going to be the easiest guy to buy low on because his owners, of course, will remember the first couple weeks of the season where he kind of exploded and his, his usage was through the roof, elite RB1 kind of status. Um, but his production has kind of plummeted over the last couple weeks. So in the beginning of the season, right, from weeks one to three, C-Mac averaged nearly 23 touches a game and 143 yards from scrimmage per matchup, which is easily an RB1 number. Then they had their bye week in week Four. And since that buy in the team's next three games, so weeks five, six, and seven, McCaffrey's usage has dipped from 23 touches a game down to 16.6 touches a game, yards from scrimmage from 143 down to 79.6 yards per game. That is RB2 numbers, maybe, depending on if he gets in the end zone or not. And in particular, over the last two weeks, he has seen 15 and 13 touches, and he has gained 66 and... Um, how much did he gain last week? I forgot. I messed up the number on there. Something something not good, like 80 yards from scrimmage without a score over the last two weeks. So he has not been putting up numbers. Um, so C-Mac owners might start to get frustrated, might start to undervalue the Carolinas running back for the rest of the season. Despite the decline in usage, though, I think what's more... Um, what's more predictive is not just the total volume of usage, but the percentage of usage he's getting or the percentage of snaps he's getting in terms of the total backfield. Because it's not like he's losing work to other running backs or it's not like he's losing, you know, passing work to other weapons. So you take a look at this tweet, seeing running back leaders in snap share on the entire season. Christian McCaffrey is number one in the NFL, getting 96% of the Carolina running back snaps uh, and breaking down further into like the opportunity and touch share, he owns 84% of the opportunity share uh, of touches as well in the Panthers' backfield. So he is still easily the main beneficiary there, still uh, an incredible athlete catching the ball out of the backfield. Uh, I think just based on his usage, his snap share, his um, the opportunity share in the backfield, he is still going to get crazy usage going forward. And if you are trading for him now, you've obviously missed out on the last couple games in which he has not produced that well. So you look at the last two games, right? And they've come against two of the toughest run defenses in the NFL right now, and they were both on the road. You're looking at Washington, and you're looking at the Philadelphia Eagles. So I'm not completely surprised by the outcomes of McCaffrey's production in those two games. And, you know, this is this is where it gets good, because you can try to trade for C-Mac right now while he's low, or if you want to gamble, if you're a risk taker, they do play against Baltimore's defense in Week 8. And you can gamble that C-Mac might have another poor game and then try to trade for him after that. So you can kind of choose what you want to do there. Um, either way, following Baltimore, his schedule becomes cake for the rest of the fantasy season. He gets Tampa Bay twice. He gets Pittsburgh. He gets Detroit. Um, and then his fantasy 
playoff matchups, weeks 15 and 16, are New Orleans and Atlanta. So the rest of the season schedule is incredible. Um, he plays Baltimore now, so you might be able to buy him after that. So C-Mac is number one on my buy low. Number two, someone I'm not incredibly high on, but someone that you might be able to get for pretty cheap right now, and that is Will Fuller, wide receiver of the Houston Texans. Now, for the last couple of weeks, Fuller had basically played as a decoy um, prior to week seven. So in weeks five and six, he's basically a decoy because he returned from his hamstring injury and uh, and he hadn't been, you know, he hadn't been seeing any targets and he wasn't really running full routes and it just, uh, it, it was just no production out of, out of Fuller after the first couple of weeks where he kind of went off. And now he seems to be fully recovered from his hammy. He's running his normal 80 to 90% of the snaps on this offense. And week seven was definitely a good sign for Fuller. And those of you looking to buy Will Fuller because he caught six passes for six to eight yards. Um, that's nothing crazy. So it's not like the owner is going to be like, oh, he's coming off a huge game. I'm really ecstatic about Fuller and I really want to keep him. Six for 68 is more so just a good positive sign that, you know, he's back and he's still going to be a big weapon in this offense. And the other piece of this is, you know, with uh, Cutie on the field, Fuller's production is obviously dipped a little bit, but we're not really sure if that has to do with Cutie or if that has to do more with Will Fuller being less than 100% because of the hamstring. Um, however, Cutie is dealing with his own hamstring injury now, and I'm not sure if there were any updates, but supposedly it's not very serious. Uh, I expect him to miss tonight's game, the Thursday night football game, and uh, we're unsure about his return for next week. I'm uh, you know, if, if they're saying it's not that serious and uh, and he's going to be out for Thursday night, that gives them, you know, another 10 days of rest before their next game. So he might be back. Um, but for tonight, Will Fuller is definitely a good play. I don't know if you're going to be able to pull off a trade before tonight, before seeing this. Uh, but I think Will Fuller's outlook going forward, as long as he's healthy, is going to be good with Deshaun Watson. Because um, we know the connection between Fuller and Watson has been very real. And I know Watson's a little banged up right now. Um, but that would give you more incentive. You know, that's more fuel to trying to trade for Will Fuller, um, you know, something else you could just bring to the table when you're trying to trade for him and to be like, hey, Watson's like banged up anyway, so it's risky for me, but Fuller's the guy that I like right now just because his value is probably the lowest that you'll see it all season. Third on this list is wide receiver out of Detroit. You can guess which one I'm talking about. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. All three of them are coming off bad games because Matthew Stafford only attempted 22 passes in their last game, coming off a bye as well. So, I'm talking about Kenny Galladay, but I think Golden Tate would also qualify for this list. Not Marvin Jones, because I think he's kind of falling behind in terms of production of the other two. Um, so Kenny Galladay would be the guy in here, but again, Golden Tate is another good buy low candidate in my opinion. So you look at Sunday's game, and it was easily the worst of the season from a production standpoint for Galladay, right? He only saw two targets, two catches for 37 yards. Like I said, Stafford only threw the ball 22 times, but that was because Kerryon Johnson absolutely fucking exploded. Karrion Johnson looking like the GOAT. Looking like an absolute snack. I am so happy that I own him in multiple leagues of mine. Um, Karrion Johnson looked like the next coming of DeMarco Murray in his prime. And now that Karrion Johnson is establishing himself, I haven't heard anything about Theo Riddick. They're not, I like, haven't heard any practice reports. Like, what's going on there? But um, anyways, back to the point. They established a run that game, and that was what, what they wanted to do, and that was what they did the entire game, chewing up a lot of clock. They didn't pass the ball a lot, and that's probably why these wide receivers were hurt in terms of statistics. Um, but prior to this, his worst production game was a four-catch, 74-yard performance. So he's giving you 11.5 fantasy points in PPR leagues, like as a floor pretty much, and he has scored in three of five games prior to week seven. So coming off a bad week and a bye week, I think like – I think there's still a stigma about guys like Galladay or Golden Tate because you look at it and you're like, oh, there's there's too many weapons there and we don't know who's going to produce on a week-to-week -week basis between Galladay and Tate and Marvin Jones and whatnot. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to worry about that because teams that, like, that makes sense when you're talking about maybe a, a Patriots offense or if you're talking about maybe, you know, an offense like that, maybe like the Saints offense, because they have other weapons that, get so involved in the passing game. Like the, the Lions don't have a fourth wide receiver. The Lions don't have a pass catching tight end. So all of the targets and the snaps funnel into these guys. They run three wide receiver sets more than any team in the NFL right now. So all three of them are on the field all the time. Uh, Galladay's running like 88 or 90% of the snaps in this offense. So you don't have to worry about like his playing time as like in respect to Marvin Jones and Golden Tate. So I just want that to kind of fade away from people's mindsets when you're talking about 
Kenny Galladay. Um, Kenny Galladay owns a 20% target share in this offense. Marvin Jones is only seeing 17% of the targets. And he's already seen five targets inside the 10 yard line through six games. And Kenny Galladay has eight catches of 20 plus yards. He's seeing valuable targets. He's seeing downfield targets. He's playing on 90% of the snaps um, in an offense that's probably undervalued right now. So I think Galladay just brings a great blend of mix, uh, a great mix of, you know, floor and ceiling to your team. And he's a threat to score on any given Sunday. Um, I think you might be able to get him at a discount right now off of this bad game. So we're going to move to the sell high candidates. On buy low, we had C-Mac, we had Will Fuller, we had Kenny Galladay or Golden Tate. Before we do, though, I want to give a shout out to today's sponsors. That is fantasyjocks.com. Y'all know they represent your mans. They are the industry leader in fantasy league gear, equipment, prizes, trophies, whatever you want to do. They got belts, they got rings, they got trophies, they got draft boards. If you play in other fantasy sports, they have all the fantasy sports covered. So whatever you're looking for, fantasyjocks.com has you super, 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 super high quality gear. You can get this stuff customized to, uh, to say your league's name on it. Like uh, in the E-Town Get Down League, we have E-Town Get Down Championship on ours as well as the previous three or four league winners sketched on the side, which you can do on trophies, which you can do on the belt. They got a lot of dope stuff on the website. So go check out fantasyjocks.com. 10% off using code TAKE10. Your man's is hooking you up. Uh, thank you for sponsoring today's video, fantasyjocks.com. Um, last thing as well, if you are looking for more exclusive content, uh, more access to fantasy football number stats, analysis, live streams, whatever, I am on Patreon as well. So patreon.com slash BDGE. You can get my weekly rankings on there. I do a private live stream every Wednesday night where I'm answering all your sit star questions and trade questions, which took place last night if you're watching this on Thursday, but it's Wednesday while I'm filming this, so it actually hasn't taken place yet. That's some crazy shit right there, huh? Uh, but yeah, check out patreon.com slash BDGE where you can get a lot more exclusive content from your boy. It's also a way to support your favorite creator, so uh, I would appreciate you checking that out. And let's move over to the sell high players. Uh, before you do that, if you are enjoying the video thus far, I would appreciate a thumbs up down below. Just scroll down, hit that thumbs up, and scroll your ass back up to my pretty ass face. Rob Gronkowski is number one on my sell high list. And I got I to gotta tell you, I did not think it would come to this, uh, especially in the preseason and after week one. Um, I was, I was kind of kicking myself because I didn't draft any Rob Gronkowski in any of my redraft leagues. Um, not, I thought he was an incredible value at the end of the second round. But I just didn't want to take a tight end that early in drafts. Turns out that, you know, Gronk is not the clear tight end one in fantasy anymore. And to be honest, I'm not sure he's really even that close to Zach Ertz and, and Travis Kelsey at this point. So Gronk missed last week's game, of course, and he's dealing with back spasms. We don't know what his status for week eight is going to be. And any injury is notable, especially a, a back injury for Rob Gronkowski, because he has a long history with injuries already, and that was kind of the concern for uh, a lot of people coming into 2018. He always carried that injury risk. If he was healthy, he was going to produce like the tight end one. If he was unhealthy, then he was going to miss a lot of games, which we've seen year in and year out from Gronk. Um, and since it's a back injury, I know back spasms aren't that serious, but you never know what he's really dealing with. I feel like the Patriots kind of, you know, hide things, and and we don't know what they're dealing with. But back back injuries concern me with uh, with with tight ends especially, like Tyler Eifert, because you're using so much of your back on, on every play, whether it's blocking or if you're catching passes, you're getting hit, and whatever it is. Um, it's not a good injury to deal with for a guy like Gronkowski. But what else concerns me is probably the bigger concern is just Gronk's on-the-field play. His production and his usage just has not been there compared to previous years. Um, since week one, he has not seen more than seven targets in a game. He's not scored a touchdown since week one. Um, his yardage totals since week one. Following week one, so starting in week two, 15, 51, 44, 75. The last game that he played in week, uh, I think it was week six, or they had a buy, after whatever his last game prior, after that was, he caught nine, he had 97 yards, 97 receiving yards on just three catches, but that was thanks to like a deep ball at the end of the game that he ended up catching. If he didn't catch that, then you're looking at another um, like 45 yard game at a Gronk. So it kind of seems like defenses have figured out how to defend Gronk. Um, for better or worse, to their detriment because the Patriots are still winning games in plenty of other ways. But they are 
completely selling out to stop Gronk. They are double teaming him on almost every play, if not triple teaming him, especially in the red zone, in the end zone. They're taking him out of the play completely. They're not letting Rob Gronkowski beat them. And it's almost week in, week out. They are just on top of Gronk on every play. Um, and even if he is just as good as he was in the previous years, if defenses are going to play him like that, it's going to be very hard for him to get open. You have a guy like Tom Brady with six other weapons that he can choose from. He's not going to force it to Gronk when he can outlet it to James White, throw it to Josh Gordon now, Julian Edelman's back, right? He's got a lot of other weapons to choose from. And if defense is stuck on taking Gronk out of the game, which they have been in nearly every game so far this year, um, he is not going to produce. So regardless of all the, the bad that's happened with Gronk, the one thing I could probably guarantee is you are going to be able to sell Gronk at top dollar right now, just based on his name alone. Um, you're still going to be be able to sell him as an elite tight end one, probably as the tight end one. Um, so if I were you, if I was someone who was a Gronk owner, what I would try to do, I don't know if this will work or not, but maybe try to find the OJ Howard owner in your league Maybe try to flip Gronk for OJ Howard plus, uh, you know, a really valued um, skill player asset and uh, and see what you could do there. Maybe like, I don't know, Gronk for Joe Mixon and OJ Howard or Gronk for, you know, some, something along those lines and see what you could pull off. But I would try to flip Gronk for another tight end unless you have a backup tight end already. Um, but look for a team that has a, a good tight end for rest of season going forward, like an OJ Howard or David Njoku, along with a really another high valued skill player. So you can get kind of a two for one, but it's not a huge fall off at the tight end position. That's what I would do. So Gronk is number one on my sell high. Number two is Jordy Nelson of the Oakland Raiders. Now, I, I never liked Jordy Nelson this year, and I, I doubt his value is really that high. But following the Amari Cooper trade, to the Dallas Cowboys, everyone is going to look at Jordy Nelson and be like, oh, he becomes the clear wide receiver one there in the Oakland Raiders offense. While that is technically true, he's going to be the wide receiver one on the depth chart. That means that Jordy is going to be facing off against all the opposing cornerback ones. And this ain't Jordy from three years ago, four years ago, where he can beat man coverage and press coverage and beat guys down the sideline and runs crisp routes where he can, you know, he's not going to be able to take on all these top cornerbacks uh, week over week over week and be able to, you know, play with the same stamina down the stretch. I, don't, I just don't think Jordy is um, is capable of doing that anymore at this point in his career. Like, Amari Cooper is barely able to do it and uh, as a wide receiver one in Oakland, and we saw how inconsistent he was from a production standpoint. So, Jordy has been, like, himself, he's been really inconsistent this year. He had that one good game where he had, you know, the big yardage, and then he scored a couple touchdowns in the games following that, but, like, one of the touchdowns was – a bullshit touchdown I shouldn't have counted and his stats look better than what they even should be right now for Jordy Nelson so um the next two weeks they take on Indianapolis and they take on San Francisco so that's something that you could sell him or sell owners on if you're trying to move Jordy Nelson because you know like I said a lot of people are going to look at Jordy and assume he's the wide receiver one now that Cooper is gone but I think they're going to spread the ball around a lot I think this offense first of all is a mess right there are reports coming out of the locker room that there's a rift between Derek Carr and the rest of the players, and Derek Carr might get traded because his contract's terrible, and they're just cleaning house completely. So, you know, it, it's just going to be a bad offense overall. It wouldn't surprise me if, like, Jared Cook and Jalen Richard ended up getting more targets on a week-over-week -week basis than, than Jordy Nelson. Um, they also play at Cincinnati in Week 15 and then Denver in Week 16, so not easy matchups there for a passing offense. Um, so sell high on Jordy if you can. Or even if you want to wait and, and gamble on it and see if he has a big game in this week or the next week or something like that and then try to sell him, I would do that. But I don't see him um, playing anywhere near the wide receiver one status that people might make him out to be. Third on this list is Jordan Howard of the Chicago Bears. It's clearly time to move on from Jordan Howard and this Bears backfield outside of Tariq Cohen. If you could sell him on his name, it, it might be tough to sell him, to be honest with you. And that's probably the key point that you would be selling him on, just the fact that he's Jordan Howard. And he's coming off a touchdown game, which was, you know, people were so high on him coming into the season because they're like, oh, scored nine touchdowns in this offense a year ago, and they're so much better now. But it's a different, a different offense, a different, a different scheme. He is currently running back 32 right now in fantasy football. He's just not being used in Matt Nagy's offense the way he was last year. Um, I was looking at some numbers, and I kind of started breaking them down, comparing 2017 to 2018. And what I found is... There have been just two games in 2018 that Jordan Howard has gotten 15-plus carries. Um, in 2017, 
He had 15 plus carries in 10 of 16 games. Uh, he also had five 100 plus yard rushing games last year. So he clipped the 100 yard rushing mark five different times last year. Uh, he has not touched the century mark yet in 2018. He hasn't gone over 70 rushing yards since week one. And the touchdowns are very few and far between. So him coming off of a touchdown game um, and this offense kind of on the upswing is something that you might be able to sell other owners on. And, you know, we also thought he was going to be more involved in the passing game after the reports all offseason. And then you look at the first two weeks, right, where he's uh, he had five targets in week one, five catches, four targets in week two, three catches. Uh, and then he was pretty much completely phased out of the pass catching role in that offense. And over the last four games, he has seen a total of five targets and has had three catches. Um, you know, and Tariq Cohen has completely taken over that pass catching role in the backfield. And Cohen has now outtouched Jordan Howard in two of their last three games. But when you look at the snap splits, I think that's what's more telling here. This is percentage wise. So Basically, in week one, Jordan Howard had 71% of the snaps. Cohen was on the field for 40% of the snaps. And you could see it was heavily skewed towards Howard in week one, week two, week three. And that offense was not looking good. And you see how good the offense has been over the last three weeks. And you look at the snap percentage splits of the three run, of the two running backs. And uh, it's still in favor of Howard. But if Howard's only getting 50 to 55% of the snaps and he's not getting any involvement in the passing game, he's really almost useless to um, fantasy owners, especially that are in PPR league. So Cohen is is the back to own in this backfield going forward, just the way this offense is made up. So um, it's not looking good for Howard owner. So if you could sell him for anything like decent, I would probably go ahead and do so coming off this touchdown game. So that would be my third and final sell high guy. So for buy low, we had Christian McCaffrey, Will Fuller, and Kenny Galladay or Golden Tate. For sell high, we had Gronk, we had Jordy Nelson, and we had Jordan Howard. Um, that's going to wrap up this week's video for trade targets. And if you enjoyed the video, thumbs up would be incredible. Um, I would very much appreciate that because it lets, you, lets me know that you appreciate it. And thus, I'll be happy. There'll be a smile on my face. I'll know I'm appreciated. I'll keep making these videos. Also, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Drop a comment down below who are your favorite trade targets at the moment. If you are listening via podcast, a rating and review would be gorgeous. I would appreciate a five star, but I would love any review and that's gonna wrap it up so i will see y'all <coughs> oh man i gotta stop yelling i'll see y'all on saturday for my top dfs plays of week